Good afternoon. We think this is V6 Ops. So if you think this is something else or you're doing something else, please find another place to do it. So, uh, observe the note well. Um, a few housekeeping things. Uh, there's a pink box up here. If you're speaking, if you're speaking and you're standing outside the pink box, the meat echo people will frown on you mightily. So, stand in the pink box. Um, so, let me move ahead to showing you the agenda. There we go, completely visible. <laughs> My goodness. And there must be a Zoom thing here. Here we go. Okay, so now the agenda is actually readable. Uh, this is the agenda that we posted last week. Uh, do we have agenda bashing? Do people want it? Jordy. Uh, I have a banner. <coughs> about the IPCC deployment system. Right? Yeah. Uh, I have a banner. Okay, consider yourself at the end of that. Yeah. Everybody gets sick while that moves around. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. Any other agenda bashing? Um, okay. So with that, um, let's hear. Tori, are you online with Meet Echo? Huh? He's present in Java, so, which would be Meet Echo. Press the big red button, he should yeah. be on the wall. And also, the Meet Echo uh, uh, capture card is copying part of the image. I don't know if you can recycle or you know, just let it unplug it. Uh, so, so, what, I have to put it on this thing? So, it's no. copying it. The, the left 10% uh, is copied. Just, just, pull, just pull the video plug out. If you can pop it, uh, no, or the connect access to the video, you can oh, oh, use it. So. That looks identical. Meet up, I was displaying it. Ah, okay, okay. So, actually, John, I've got you up first. Mr. Brzezowski. All those slides, man. It's gonna take forever. All those slides. Good slide. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, right, hello. John Brzezowski here. Gunther, are you here? There he is. Okay, great. So short and sweet. I will be your best friend and give you many minutes of your day back, hopefully. Um, so we have one slide to present. So uh, I, I was a slacker. Gunther was not. Uh, he was generous to produce an updated 01 version of the draft. We, he and I spoke earlier this week and believe that we've incorporated, um, I want to say, a lot of the feedback that we got thus far. So we still have some homework to do. 
uh, based on the, one of the pieces of feedback that we got from the working group uh, last time was, you know, really kind of make this about the, tech, the, the technical bits around the deployment model. So uh, we kind of removed some of the captive portal, kind of other adjacent material, probably put that into a separate draft and then submit it, you know, separately. Uh, so for now, we're trying to keep we're trying to keep this the wheels on this bus and this this work moving forward. Um, I think we're both pretty confident that we've missed a few comments. Uh, I know Bernie Voles had sent some mail to us either on the list or directly, so that's evidence to us that we we still have some stuff to do. So we don't we don't claim that O1 is ready for, you know, you know prime, like you know, like an mm. official step uh, next step. So we we are uh, we'll I think we'll produce a O2 for for the next ITF. And then after that, we'd like to, we probably intend to ask the working group to discuss some next steps. Okay, so when do you expect you'll have the Dash O2? Hopefully many weeks before Seoul. Before Famous, Seoul. Famous last words, yes. That's your, Seoul is in 2020. Uh, <laughs> so so is, are you talking about August? Or are you yeah, talking well, I, about I, October I, 31st? No, I think, no, well, you never know. But uh, yeah, our, our goal is the, before Labor Day, before, you know, in, okay. in August. That's our intention. So we would like, you know, some activity on the list, et cetera. That'd be nice, right? Well, because it would be nice if, if we actually had your updated draft then to run a review and uh, ask for, you know, how, how are we doing? Um, if it takes until October to get it out, then it'll probably be ratcheted by now, the ITF we, itself. We honestly, Fred, think that the, that what's left should be relatively minor. So that's why when, we, when Gunther and I okay. spoke a couple days ago, we really thought that we could, you know, in, in between holiday for the rest of the summer, we have, you know, sometime in early September, we can get it out the door, which should be plenty of time before, uh, before the next ITF. Okay. Okay. So this is not, we're not asking for anything. We're kind of just giving you a heads up. You know, this is coming. And then we, we hope that, you know, either post Seoul going into Chicago, we can, we can kind of talk about, you know, moving this thing forward. Lorenzo, are you standing at the mic or are you just standing? Uh, yeah, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm sort of waiting. But, oh, it's my turn. Um, some of us have um, talked, I've been talking about uh, uh, the possibility of a bit in the PIO that says this R is exclusive to you. Would you be willing to work on that? Yeah, that's fine. We, we you know, as you and I talked about, ha happy to work on that. However, the one comment that I think you and I talked about before is we, we would still like to see this go about its way and then we can work on that separately. I don't, I don't want to tie the two things together. Yeah, absolutely. What, what I'm suggesting is that also because, because any such bit might, would, any such bit will have to be, um, yeah, we'll have to run the gauntlet of six man. Um, as v6 ops it is our chart is in our charter to provide input to six man on what changes in the ipv6 specifications might be useful so if we had um, some text in this document that said it would be useful to have to be able to tell the host that their prefix was dedicated then um, then we could go to six man and say hey this is why we need it okay a quick comment I noticed you're not wearing your badge the um the, the Jabber scribe, Jabber scribe uh, Lorenzo uh, asked me Sorry. to make sure that people actually wore their badge and made it, put it out somewhere where he could see it, and actually announced their name. So I have no idea who that <laughs> person standing at the back is. <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Lorenzo Colidi, and yeah, my, I don't have my badge because I just came back from lunch, but now I do. So, ironically, of course, the Jabber scribe is standing at the mic and had already typed his name into the Jabber room before he stood up. Yes, so I'm Michael Abrams, so I'm going to type my name into the Jabber afterward. Yes, just to remind everybody, check that both your sides of your badge is visible and that you're not obscuring it from me where, uh, where I'm sitting there. Okay, second thing. The thing that he was talking about, I already have 30 sentences written on that thing. <laughs> I, I plan to bring it to Six Man in August. Uh, so uh, th th I'm hoping to get a zero zero out. I'm going to on, on this thing. So. Um, uh, if they start to throw tomatoes, uh, it, it would be help if there was something in this uh, we'll just, next version. So we'll just get some new working group chairs for six minutes. I'll take care of that, no problem. So um, <laughs> the um, so one, one piece of comment, uh, so it, two things. Michael, if you have anything that you could lend us text-wise that we could drop into our draft to kind of do what Lorenzo was referring to, that would be uh, greatly appreciated, right? Um, you, would it help if I just email you what I have scribbled yes, so far? That, that would be lovely. Thank you. It, it's very, very rough, but yep. okay. That'd be perfect. Thanks. And then second thing, Fred, uh, you know, uh, I got some good news earlier. This before between the two ITFs, we're actually going to start rolling this out in parallel with this new draft being uh, prepared. So by the time, certainly by the time Korea rolls around, we should have some some feedback for you, like operationally, like you know, real life deployment type stuff. 
So maybe that maybe that Lorenzo helps uh, as far as kind of um, justifying supporting some additional changes that we need to make in in the protocol. So cool. Thank, Thank you. Thank you much. Okay, now Tori. Tell me Tori's online. Who was it before? Ironically, I pressed the button. It looks just like his logo. Yep. yep. Tori, can we hear you? Try it again. Miroka says no participant speaking. Okay. Um, his mic shows muted. It also shows him as an observer rather than a participant. Okay. Could be a problem. That, that could be a problem. Okay, what do I need to do to change that? Uh, he needs to log in as a participant. Mm. Okay, uh, Tori, uh, Joel tells me that you need to re log in as a participant instead of an observer. For what it's worth, Medico is helping us out online and saying he can just raise his hand and we should be able to call on him by doing that. Oh, but they may, that may require you to participate in privileges. <laughs> Clicking the hand icon will change him to presenter. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. All right. Pretty well. So, we're ready. I guess that uh, you're advancing the slides. Um, okay. So, this draft is uh, a very short and uh, neat one, and I hope to keep the presentation likewise. Um, what it does basically is it says uh, that uh, 64 uh, slash um, 16 is to be designated for IPv6, IPv4 translation. And uh, the reason for that is uh, that the um, well known prefix from RFC 6052 is just a slash 96. And uh, you cannot uh, use that if you want to use. Uh, more than one translation system in your network because obviously there's only one well-known prefix and uh, you can only use that for a single instance of your uh, uh, translation systems and uh, also that particular well, prefix uh, wait, go. let me see if i can mute some things here all right um so um, that particular prefix also comes with some restrictions, like they cannot be used with RFC 1918 addresses. And obviously, since it's a slash uh, 96, uh, it cannot be used with uh, with uh, a um, any other prefix that is larger, like for instance a slash 64 or whatever. An RFC 6052 has a whole range of them, so it's only a slash 96, obviously, that you can use it for. So basically what this draft says is that, well, let's just put aside the whole slash 64 slash uh, 16, so that uh, if you have multiple translation systems in your network, or if you want to use, say, NAT64 with RFC 1918 addresses or some other prefix size, then, okay, you can just pick a prefix from from um, from that uh, range. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so basically, <clears throat> it does not change the uh, designation 
of the 64 ff 9 b slash 96 prefix. Uh, so basically, the draft in its current form says that you know everything inside 64 slash 16 can be used you know locally uh, according to you know whatever the operator has in mind, uh, while the that prefix from 6052 is still only to be used as according to 6052's uh, mandates. So what David Farmer then suggested was to say, you know, maybe we should uh, reserve a larger chunk for future well-known prefixes from, you know, future RFCs that uh, designate uh, uh, translation standards. So he suggested a uh, slash 24 that would you know uh, encompass the prefix from 6052 and you know so you know grandfather that in uh, it could also be a slash 20 I guess and um, and uh, I think that that sounds like a good idea and then but I would uh, ask you guys if uh, you agree with that or not and if so I'll just put that in the next version of the draft and uh, I don't know if you want to ask that right away or if we should do it at the end. Uh, I actually can't hear anything from you now, so. Uh, oh. uh, RFC 6052, uh, so this is as a past BEHAVE co-chair since this document came out of BEHAVE. <laughs> um, 6052 explains that the FF9B, the re the, that magic number is in there such that the prefix is checksum neutral, meaning 64 plus that gives you zero. And just opening up without having said guidance would um, uh, sort of violate the behave recommendation that the prefix be checksum neutral to avoid a bunch of other issues. And so uh, I guess the recommendation from behave would be any other prefix really ought to also be checksum neutral. If you pick something else, pick something else that checks some, um, check some to zero. Okay. so. Um, the checksum neutrality uh, is only really relevant uh, for 6145 type translation. This is not really relevant for, say, NAT64, because the other address in the NAT64 translation will not be translated in a checksum neutral manner. But uh, in spite of that, the 64FF9B prefix is immensely popular for NAT64 deployments, and I've been told that it's even used uh, on the IATF NAT64 network. Uh, so, so there is also a value in having a prefix uh, for IPv6, IPv4 translation that is distinct from your, uh, you know, your normal allocation. Uh, because um, uh, even though it's not uh, checksum neutral, because the technology you're using might not be. And I'm not sure, Dave, that you can actually come up with a different one that's checksum neutral. I mean, 0064 inverted is FF9B. There's one per 16 bits, right? Is there? Okay. Uh, because your actual, say, subnet prefix is going to be a slash 64, right? Um, and if you reserve, say, all of such and such slash 24, then you may be able to come up with something in between. I don't know, is there enough bits in there to, in between 24 and 64, you got 40 bits there. Can you come up with something else to check some neutral? Just like that right there is a 32 bit number. You got another space for another 32 bit number, like 64 FF9B colon 64 FF9B, for example. Okay, so this sounds like it begs for a sentence or two and then maybe in an, an appendix that walks through possible values. Okay, and uh, Tori, uh, Dave went thumbs up. Uh, Lorenzo Coridi, I think uh, 64FF9B, the checksum neutrality is important because in certain technologies, if you don't have it, you actually have to drop the packet because you don't know what's going to come out on the other end. So it, it is important. It's not just a, it's not just a performance optimization. It's 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 necessary for correctness. Um, <clears throat> couple of other points. Um, I, I slash sixteen really. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I, I you know it seems like a lot. I mean, I guess it you know maybe it doesn't matter, uh, but it it does seem like a lot. Um, 
And one other thing I wanted to say, though, is that the, I think, I believe, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen this written down somewhere, but I believe that the reason why uh, you must not use RFC 1918 addresses with 64 FF9B is because um, a 64 FF9B is not unique globally, and RFC 1918 is also not unique globally. And so the, uh, you're not allowed to use something that's not unique globally. All of this range will have that problem. So I don't know if we want to say that that's no longer a requirement, but, but this is, you know, this is a, a factor in the decision. We would have to sort of reverse that earlier uh, decision. And finally, I don't see why you would not use your own address space for this because it has those uniqueness properties. And so you can make it, maybe you can make it check some neutral. I don't know, but it, it seems like, yeah. Okay, uh, let me see if I remember all three questions there. Uh, the first one was uh, about the slash, the slash 16 that is too large. Uh, I came up with that because uh, with uh, RFC 6052, you have uh, a range of prefix sizes that it defines. Uh, and the largest one of those is slash 32. And if uh, you're supposed to be able to actually deploy multiple um, implement, uh, deployments of uh, translation, and those deployments you want to use slash 32 prefixes with, as you know, uh, 6052 allows, then you need something larger than slash 32. And then going to the next, uh, to the next uh, group, as in the next column, seems like a logical uh, place to go. Although, it, of course, it could be uh, somewhere in between. But you know. uh, the other question was. Um, I think well, at least the third question was uh, why I wouldn't use my my uh, normal as in my own uh, allocated space for this, and that is uh, uh, because it has a value to, to distinguish, you know, the IP the untrusted IPv4 internet from your own address space, uh, and you can see that because uh, um, I think. A large majority, at least from what I've experienced, of NAT64 deployments are using the well-known prefix instead of using a a, um, a um, uh, provider-specific prefix, including the IETF network, uh, as I said before. And the checksum neutrality part is not the reason for that, because checksum neutrality doesn't make any difference for NAT64. Yet operators prefer to use this prefix, and it, it does make sense because, you know, if you have, uh, say, some uh, administrator of your mail server or DNS server saying, okay, this is my address space, I'm going to allow free relaying or free resolving through this uh, system, uh, and if that prefix, you know, includes basically the entire IPv4 internet, then you might actually open up for some some abuse that you, you did not intend. And keeping your translation prefix as totally separate uh, would help alleviate that. And um, then there was the question about the RFC 1918 usage. And I don't really know where that came from. Uh, you're probably right. But as an operator, I see that, OK, I have some IPv4 uh, only parts of my network, and I have some IPv6 only parts of my network. And I'd, uh, those IPv4 only parts of the network might be using private addresses, and uh, I want you know this v6 parts to reach the v4 part via NAT64, and if they're using the uh, 50, 6052 prefix, you know they can't. Uh, if they're using a network specific prefix, then they can. And I don't really see the technical reason why that should not be able to work. So you can say that the 64 slash 16 usage would kind of be like a you know, network specific prefix in a sense, only that it wouldn't be from your own address space. I, th I think I, that was all the questions, but uh, remind me. But, yeah. As, as for the last point, I think that that's the whole point of 64 FF9B. You must not use 1918. It's because it's not unique. 
And so we would have to at least say something in the draft saying we thought we, well, we, we did at 64 ff 9 b when it said must not use RFC 1918 because it wasn't unique. And here we must come up with something. Maybe we can say, well, we're going to re randomly generate the bits in the middle and there's never going to be a collision because otherwise what's going to happen is that everyone's going to use a 64 ff 9 b column one and then <laughs> everyone has the same IP address and we have the problem that you were trying to solve. So I think we have to say something about that here. Hi, David Skenazi from Apple here. As someone who spends way too much of his time staring at TCP dumps with 64, FF90, and other things, I'm going to start by completely challenging your premise. The deployments that use this generally do not use 64, FF9B. Uh, the one most notable one in the US is T Mobile US, who's been deploying v6 only and at 64. They use their own prefix, which I'm not going to say, but I've known by heart by now. But I don't see why anyone would want to use the well-known prefix. It's a slash 96 of your own address space, which is nothing. Uh, the only people who actually need to look at IPv6 <coughs> addresses, which hopefully will be less and less people, uh, they end up knowing it by heart, whatever it is. And uh, having some, it's sad but true, uh, but the, uh, having something unique that is on your network, if you want to prevent people from outside from using it, it's one entry in your routing table, it's really trivial. And that solves all of these problems that you're stating. Like you can have as many of these as you want on your own network. They're all as safe as this. You can use RFC 1918 space and you're done. So I'm, why this effort? And burning one, uh, a slash 16, yeah, as Lorenzo would say, is insane. Uh, or is it worth it? Uh, Okay, so so the reason why I want to uh, a bad echo. Uh, let me mute. Okay, so so again, the reason why I want to to use you know separate prefixes to actually keep this you know both visually separate and also not part of my own address space because uh, uh, I just don't want uh, people to mistake. Uh, the IPv4 internet mapped into uh, v6 as you know my own network, as I mentioned to Lorenzo. That's kind of the uh, basic premise, and uh, and it to me it seems that 64 uh, slash 16 is already <laughs> sort of set aside for this already because I don't really see that you this one getting assigned to the RIRs, considering that you have this FF9B bit in the middle and it seems uh, uh, already like a convention that the 64 in the beginning of the address you know, identifies some sort of translation so maybe not in, in uh, actually uh, set aside in an RFC or in the IANA registry but I think that you know if you're looking at an address and that's what you're going to be thinking if you see this 64 beginning. Okay, so it sounds like the only argument in favor of doing this is so some human operator somewhere can look at a TCP dump and go, oh, this is for a NAT64, so what, what am I missing? I mean, if you want to Yes, uh, Jen and Kova. I actually totally agree that you sometimes using your own address space, it makes everything quite complicated from ACL and routing perspective. Because I do want to have it from totally separate address block. So basically what I have to do, I have to take my address space, split it in half, and use half of it for all this special stuff, and use the rest of it for my network. Because this should not be part of my network, because it's a kind of internet addresses, right? So I have to go to RIR and ask them, give me please another V6 address space so I can use it for all this special purpose. So I totally agree that it would be really nice to have a special block, Probably not slash 16, but actually <laughs> kind of like of slash 24. But yeah, I, I can tell you that I have this problem right now, right? Mixing all this special stuff with my internal address space makes ACL's management nightmare. No, no, you're in this work. So that's can, can you guys have that fight at the mic, please? Um, and actually, you actually, actually doesn't work because of 6724, the label doesn't match and you prefer IPv4, it doesn't work, you can't use ULA. And also I want to just mention to Tori, we've got a couple more people in line. Uh, Pierre Fister, sorry. 
I was about to say that maybe ULA would be a solution, but I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm not going to say that now. Um, but reading the draft, at least I did not understood from the draft why it's so important to have a well-known prefix. Uh, I've worked a little bit of on, on map, uh, with, which has some translation with map T. And in map, you use global addresses, and it's a, it's a feature, it's not a bug. Um, and, and actually, I think that proposing this 64 slash uh, 16, um, for, the, for the reason that you may want to deploy multiple translation mechanism, it's going to trigger the opposite benefit. Like people are going to use column, column one, and, and you will create collisions. Whereas if you force people to use their own address space, it will probably avoid collisions. Well, the question for uh, I'm wondering here is, is, is it really a problem that there is a collision? Because wherever 64 FF9B is used and is being used in you know many places at once, that one is would be colliding, colliding in the same sense as, F as uh, 64 colon 1 slash 96. So uh, as long as it's, uh, you know, kept inside of a single admi uh, administrative domain, I don't see the problem with collisions, really. Uh, Dmitry Kopman, just a quick comment. If you really want to conserve and don't delegate slash 16, we can just use 64 colon 00, zero and then put the complement 16, sorry two octaves down the road. So you, know, you can do the math. So basically it would be like 64 colon 00, zero xx colon 1 y z z slash oh, that would be 48. And so basically you can do the same complement as long as these blocks are no wider than even 64. I mean, well, and you only need slash 96 for each given. So that's not a problem. And then we can say, okay, 64 is all ever possible translations. And translations like that, you just designate 64 colon 00. zero. So be like, so 64 would be reserved, but not all, of, not all of it would be wasted on such mechanisms. So other types can be implemented in the future. As I'm definitely open to to you know saying that this should be a slash 64 instead of a slash 16. Like I said, the only reason uh, the reason why I picked 16 was because 6052 allows down to slash 32, and um, you know, I saw it as a desirable property that it should be possible to <coughs> to um, allow for multiple uh, deployments of a translation mechanism that, for some reason, would want to use slash to their use. But if if uh, that is not you know worth it uh, in the opinion of the working group, then then it's no problem for me to change this to say a slash sixty four. Lorenzo Colidi, who uses the 32-bit mode? Lorenzo Colidi, who uses the 32-bit mode? Uh, I don't know about the 32-bit mode. I just observed that it's in uh, 6052. Um, well, can we declare that it was a bad idea? And, uh, and, and, or can we put the bits at the end? Uh, perhaps. Uh, I don't think this draft would be the right place to do that, but I'll point out that uh, during the um, discussion of, I think, the previous version of this uh, draft, uh, I think uh, Xing Li uh, confirmed that they were using multiple instances of slash 64s in their network for IVI translation. So obviously uh, that use case would not uh, work if we reduce this reservation to a slash 64, but that might be okay. So. Uh, David Lampater, speaking as a routing person, um, there's a lot of setups that can only route at the granularity of 64. So you route an entire 64 to your NAT service. So if you want to have more than one of those, then it might be more useful to have a 48 here, um, which may explain why people actually use 64 prefixes. So that's a good point. Thanks. Sorry, for clarification, since I got asked out of band, when I say 32-bit mode, I said who uses, what I meant was, who uses the mode where the IPv4 address is at the slash 32 boundary? That, that was what I meant. Sorry. I don't have an answer for you. Uh, but um, I don't think, in the 32-bit mode, I don't think the address is actually contig contiguous. It is... Um, 
it's gonna spread out over there. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly where it is. I can't remember. David Skenazi, just to clarify this for a bunch of people who haven't read the RFC. So the easiest mode of NAT64 is you have a slash 96 prefix and then you stick the V4 address at the end. For some reason, which is yet unclear to me, they decided you could also do slash 32, slash 64, and five other values where the V4, bits of the V4 address are spread out through the rest of the address space, interspersed with zeros and reserved bits. I have never seen deployments of those, and I think they're insane. And that's just what there is. But what most people end up doing is in slash 96, and then the question is, you, on those slash 96, a bunch of the bits between 64 and 95 have to be zero. So the general recommendation is you allocate a slash 64 for your NAT64, and you put those 64 bits and then 32 zero, bits of zero, and that's your 90, slash 96 NAT64 prefix. <laughs> I think I can tell you why CERNET wanted for IVI to have part of the IPv4 address space in the prefix and part of it in the uh, IID. And the reason was they are running a network with, I think it's a thousand IPv4 only subdomains, universities, and I think 250 uh, of the same uh, universities that are IPv6 only in CERNET too. And what they're doing is converting between the one NREN and the other NREN, which are IPv4 only and IPv6 only. So they wanted to be able to distribute the IPv4 prefix in such a way that you could get it to the right university. That was their point. Now, now then there was additional issues with the IID has magic bits that have to be inverted and funny things happen to them that I never understood, but okay, it must be so. Um, Dave Taylor, you're standing at the mic. Uh, I'm standing at the mic because I have a potential answer to the question that was asked about what were they thinking. Um, there's a paragraph that's actually in there, although I'm actually happy to hear that you haven't actually heard it, seen it deployed. Uh, the, uh, on the topic of uh, why would you want a prefix, sorry, why would you want a suffix that's, that's 64 bits or, or at least some large number, right? In other words, why would you put the whole IPv4 address into the slash 64 prefix portion? Um, and there's a paragraph that explains, I think, the motivation. Uh, like, but like I said, I'm glad to see that you didn't that you don't see it deployed. It says there have been proposals to complement stateless translation with a port range feature. Instead of mapping an IPv4 address to exactly one IPv6 prefix, the options would allow several IPv6 nodes to share an IPv4 address, with each node managing a different range of ports. If a port range extension is needed, it could be defined later using bits currently resolved as null, preserved as null in the suffix. So you can see it was put in there as a potential future extension, and it was said that it doesn't exist right now because there was no consensus to do that, okay? So that is the answer as to why it is allowed in there is because some people want to reserve it for future extension. <laughs> I have a proposal. We don't, we, can, we don't have to deprecate this mode, even though it's insane, but what we can do is say, we can hereby define 64 FF9B something, where that something is check, check some neutral, and there's gonna be a lot of them in there. And, and it's gonna share the properties of 64 FF9B, and we could just do that, and, and you know, we don't have to waste the 16. Yeah, Joel Yigley. Uh, I mean, the rationale for trying to bid align your V4 assignments and your V6 assignments for your translator seems like um, an extra, Right, it's, it, eventually you're gonna sh snowshoe all over your V4 address space, or, yeah, um, in, 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 the, in the process of doing this. So that seems like you're, you're, you're basically just inviting yourself to have an address management mess at some point in the future when, when you have no more V4 and you're like, why do we have all these prefixes allocated in this fashion? Yeah. Yeah, Moed um, one of the co-authors of, of RFC 6052. Uh, in fact, the, yeah, the argument about the check signal rate is important only if it is used as in both source and destination. If it is used only in destination, you, you don't care because you don't, you don't have a problem of checksum neutrality. So for the NAT64 main deployment today, the checksum neutrality argument is not a good argument. So that, in fact, the checksum neutrality is there only for if, you, if it is used for both. Um, 
and for the answer for the other one, why we have, uh, in fact, inside VRFC, we have explained because we have considered also to allocate a 32 prefix for the well-known prefix, and we have rejected also that 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 the discussion for some of the arguments that are documented in the RFC itself, but just for the record. Okay, have we blown ourselves out here? Okay. Um, go ahead, Tori. Yeah, so so what I'm hearing is that uh, the feeling is that a slash 16 is at least too much, and the use case to you know allow multiple slash 32 using uh, deployments are not really worth uh, accommodating for. Uh, so uh, what David said, uh, I think, believe it was David, about uh, routing on the 64 prefix, I thought that was a good point. And if we're still going to allow for multiple instances, then it seems reasonable to say a slash 48 so that you allow for multiple slash 64 routes. So could would that be acceptable to the working group if I basically change the slash 16 to the slash 48? Um, opinions on that? Not seeing anybody leaping. Oh, here, now I see somebody oh, getting up. Cackling the mic. David Skenazi again. Um, so that would definitely be better. Um, I'm still not sure I see the value, but if it's just something like much smaller, I wouldn't feel as strongly to oppose it because uh, it's your network too. Like uh, some, I've seen people deploy 64 ff 9 e because they could, still works. So having something slightly standardized, why not? One thing, if I, if I can take 30 seconds here of something that will be relevant to everyone in the room, uh, we've been doing a lot of application testing with NAT64, now that Apple requires uh, PV6 support in all iOS apps. One thing we saw a lot uh, of were application developers hard coding 64 FF9B in their apps because they pulled up the RFC and that's what was in there. Uh, because of this, we've had to change, so the Mac comes with a NAT64 demo, uh, development mode to test your iOS apps. We had to change that to not use the well-known prefix anymore, so it would break on that. Uh, telling people to use the well-known prefix more and more could just make that worse. Right, so, so this so draft is... It sounds like you would advocate having uh, application developers actually use the DNS rather than make assumptions about the address. Well, absolutely, because that's the only correct way to do it. Uh, and we even offer an API to do that. Because on the, so our main target network is T-Mobile US because they're leading the battle for this. Uh, they use their own uh, address space. So if you hard code anything, it'll just break. Yeah, we made that observation in RFC 4192. The biggest problem in renumbering is people in ID10 T mode. So, so the, um, um, uh, this draft is for <laughs> those people that you saw the, that um, used 64FF9, CES, 64FF9E, and so on. Uh, and that is, you know, squatting at the moment. And this is basically the, the whole point is to give a, a, you know, legitimate way for those people that would like such an option to be able to, to do so. Okay, Michael Abrams, so uh, just to, for David here, what, if you could share on the list, like what did they actually, when they hard coded it, what did they do with it? I mean, I, I don't know if you can give a short explanation or, or uh, big, otherwise I'd like to see it on the list because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit curious why they, they would do that. Oh, we're still very curious as well. Um, but the to, long story short, a lot of applications have IPv4 literals. It could be because they don't trust DNS. It could be because in the country they operate in, DNS is very often hijacked. It could be because they use some protocols, say for example, that transmits v4 addresses on the wire and the Apple requirement does not make everything v6, it's just that the client app needs to work. So grab your th 32 bits from your protocol and then make it so that it reaches the NAT64. 
And what they would do is just grab those 32 bits, do 64, FF9B, call and call on those, and then send bits on the wire. Okay, Michael, here again. So basically, they bypassed your NAT64 synthesis API and just did it themselves, and then that didn't work, of course, because they they didn't they did only a small thing. When your API probably does a lot more heuristics and stuff. Correct. Thanks. Now another okay, point uh, <laughs> is that uh, the 6052 uh, prefix, the FF9B1, <laughs> it guarantees that. Um, the last 32 bits is an IPv6 address, uh, IPv4 address, sorry, because uh, that's that's in the standard. Whereas this prefix would make no such guarantee. Uh, if we make it a slash 48, it could be used with a slash 96, or it could be used with a slash 64. And if you're using a 6052 algorithm, that means that the IPv4 bits in those two cases would be in different places. But also this draft. So explicitly says that you don't necessarily need to use the 6052 algorithm because if some new technology comes along or if you uh, you know make something homemade uh, then you will still be allowed to use that uh, prefix for your own local translation system even though it doesn't even embed the whole IPv4 address anywhere in the address so it does not require 6052 uh, translation algorithm. You're allowed even if it's something else. There is Kanazi again, but in that case, when this new mechanism comes along, I certainly hope that the people inventing it will come to this room to present it and will ask for our advice, because a lot of people here know stuff, and ask Ayana for a specific prefix then. So doing this before those protocols even exist doesn't sound that useful, to me at least. So Tori, are you ready for me to go to the last slide? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, right. Um, the next version will definitely include the IANA parameters you know, in detail. doesn't today. And I need an update and possibly change the prefix size. Uh, I don't know what the feel for that was in the room since I'm not there. And um, then I'm just wondering if is this... Uh, is, is the working group willing to adopt this uh, document or not? And that's basically it. Brian Carpenter at the microphone. You've got update 6890 there. Um, the 6890 itself is in the middle of being updated, so uh, just keep an eye on that. Oh, thanks. Okay. So it seems like we have a division of opinion here on the concept. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to suggest, and this is Lee and Fred conferring live on the mic, um, that I think that Tori's gotten a lot of feedback here, um, some of which is, is indifferent, and some of which is, is hostile to the, to the document as written, but maybe not necessarily to the idea overall. Um, and there may be some utility, so maybe the, the best plan would be uh, for Tori to take back the comments he's received here and do a rewrite to see if he can reflect what he's heard from the working group, and then we can take that to the mailing list and see what kind of further discussion we get. That works for me. So I am seeing some thumbs in the room. So you so, got, got that, Tori? Does that work? Yes, absolutely. I'll do that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jen. Come on, thing you can do. It. Do you want to do you want to clicker? Do you want to clicker? You clicker. How old are we? That thing, whatever it is. Hello, let's try to solve the unsolvable problem. Uh <coughs> so we know there is a problem with pay multi-homing. I realized it about two years ago when I tried to do this. 
I so can actually, go. before you get started, let me oh. stick in a, a word up front. Uh, <laughs> the origin of this document and the work that's going on in Routing Working Group right now is an email sent by me at the request of this working group. We were sitting in Yokohama, and somebody who remains nameless when standing at the back mic, but uh, otherwise known as Lorenzo, said that uh, PA multi homing couldn't possibly work unless we had source destination routing in the enterprise network uh, in order to get packets to the, the right upstream. Uh, so we asked the routing area to go look at that. And what they are now doing is this draft is being discussed, was presented briefly in six man, we're, we're getting it here, and uh, was also discussed yesterday, I believe, in, in routing. Tuesday. I'm sorry? Tuesday. Tuesday. Two days ago. Um, and, and it's probably not perfect, but uh, they're looking for comments from V6 Ops, as in, is this responsive to the problem that was pointed out, and is it correct? Do we buy it? So, um, so Jen, back to you. Okay, so when you're trying to do multi-homing on PA address space, right? So you're getting prefixes from multiple providers, all hosts, or some of them at least, have more than one address from different blocks. And then hosts send the packet. The first problem is, how to send the packet to the correct uplink? How to send packet which has source address from ISPA block to uplink to ISPA? Because I, I do hope that at least some of ISPs do implement BCP38. Unfortunately, not of them, but some of them do. Or maybe it's their uplinks implementing BCP38. And anyway, we need to send packet to the right uplink. Second problem is I actually might want to send packets to the one particular uplink because one ISP is cheaper or faster on in general better than another. And third and probably most interesting problem is what to do if uplinks fail or come back and so on, how to uh, react to failure and recovery because we cannot start keep using uh, source addresses from ISP1 address space if I have no uplinks to ISP1. <laughs> not only because of BCP CTA, but because the return traffic will never come back. So, and indeed, there, <coughs> there have been some attempts to solve it in IPv4 way, I mean by using network address translations. Let's try to see if we can do something without address translation. So, how to send packets to correct uplink? Obviously, we need to look in the source address. It means, as Fred has mentioned, source address dependent routing. So it's a kind of network problem. Network gets a packet, and it needs to send it to the correct interface. However, the last two questions are more about how network and host talk to each other. How can we propagate either policy or network topology change uh, back to hosts? And it means we basically need to tell host which source address of all those source addresses it has on its interface to use. So we need to make some assumptions, right? As I'll show you later, it's actually reasonably uh, simple to solve some particular use cases, like just two uplinks, just two internet, and so on. We're actually trying to kind of solve more generic problem. Assumptions are normally uh, that a network will have uh, allocated address spaces from different ISPs. Those address blocks should not be overlapping. And again, we're trying to send packets to the correct uplink. And f uplink failure or situation <laughs> when network is not able to send packet to the correct uplink should be signaled back to host. And it might be a scenario when internet should be accessed from one address space, but actually another ISP provides additional services which should be accessed from only from that ISP address block, like wall garden or something like that. And indeed, we'd like to kind of not make things worse than they used to be before. So we should not affect intra-site communication between the hosts. So it's a kind of example of topology, right? It could be much, much simpler in real life, but in general, we're talking about having side H routers which are connecting to different ISPs. And some of those ISPs could provide additional either link or some services through the same uplink. For example, as you can see on the host H1 on the bottom of the slide. 
might be a special service provided only by SPB and should be accessible only from red address space. So, first part of the problem, network. Let's say that host somehow, I let's assume so somehow could select a source address. How can network properly send it to the correct ISP? I'll actually go into go quite briefly through it. So basically, source address dependent routing. For each ISP, for each source address block, a forwarding table could be created, created a scoped forwarding table, which basically is scoped to the particular address source. And it's also, so basically if I have two ISPs, it will be two scoped forwarding tables, one scoped for uh, addresses from uh, that ISP address space. It, it might be that your a router also has a unscoped forwarding table, or in other words, scope to all possible uh, source addresses. Uh, the good thing about it, what we definitely need to do is to be able to age routers to send packets to the right uplink, which means we do not have, in general, to deploy this new feature on every single router on the network. It would be okay just to have it on age router first and let all other routers send packets using standard destination routing to the edge, and edge will take care of proper source destination routing. Uh, yeah, how we create scope tables, basically the current proposal is every router advertise either unscoped or scoped uh, routes, and then scoped forwarding uh, tables are created based on first scoped uh, routes. For example, if age routers advertised red and blue scoped routes as well as black one unscoped. All blue routes go into blue forwarding table, red routes go into red forwarding table, and also unscoped forwarding entries are created. And then, just to make sure intra-site communication is possible, we can actually add all more specifics which do not exist in scoped forwarding table from unscoped. More details are in the draft. And I'm pretty sure almost nobody has read it. If you want to read it and you're more interested in V6 part, you can read section four. If you're more interested in routing part, it's section three. So you don't have to read all 44 pages right now. Uh, packet forwarding forwarding quite simple. A router is supposed to look at the source address, look at the appropriate forwarding scoped forwarding table. If source address does not belong to any of the existing scoped forwarding table, router supposed to look into unscoped forwarding table. Something like this, yeah, you have a packet from blue source, you look in the blue forwarding table, and so on. The interesting thing is, if all routers in the network actually support source uh, address dependent routing, you might potentially get rid of unscoped forwarding table, which means you couldn't anymore leak any insane source addresses outside. It's basically BCP38 out of the box. No more link local source addresses, no more ULA source addresses, or site local, which I still see in actually at the age after 12 years after we deprecate them, and so on. It's kind of side benefit. So yeah, incremental deployment. Yeah, as I said, we can first create forwarding, scoped forwarding table on the edge, it will lead to some suboptimal routing, yeah? And if your side edge routers are not connected to each other directly, you might need to create some tunnels to send a packet from one side edge router to another. Yeah, and then you can basically slowly upgrade all routers to support this new feature. Now, it's, I think it's all quite straightforward. Let's look in the more tricky part, host and network communication. How can I influence the source address selection on a host? We have this nice source address selection algorithm, and if you look at this, there are some rules which might be applicable, which we might use somehow. First of all, if you have a deprecated address, try not to use it. Okay, let's remember that. Then this lovely rule 5.5, which is unfortunately not implemented in every operating system, which said if two different routers advertises, advertise two different PIOs for Slack, try to use source address from the prefix advertised by next hop you are going to send packet to. It's actually quite interesting that we can use it. 
And also, yeah, if you still could not select the source address out of the candidate address list, look in the uh, labels, in the label table. How we actually can configure source address on a host? You might use the HTTPv6, and in, in this case, it means you might actually influence, you might actually change a label table on the host. Or you can use Slack and pro try to influence next hop selection and influence which addresses are deprecated and which are not. And yeah, indeed, we still need an ability to signal error to the host. If host, after all our efforts, still selected the wrong source address, let's be able to signal those situations back to the host. Uh, just clarifying, when you say RAs, do you mean PIOs, RAOs, or both? I mean, I mean sending array to host, and that array might contain different information, such as default router lifetime, default router preference, RIO, PIO, and other stuff. Okay, so you're meaning all the stuff that might ever go into yes, an array. Yes, and I'll talk about it later. I'm basically using, I'm, what, what I want to say is using router advertisements to influence source address selection on the host. Dave Taylor. Rule 5.5 is influenced by RIO. Rule 3 is influenced by PIO. <laughs> no, Rule 5.5 5 influenced by router preference, default router preference. You might not have RIO, actually. Uh, yes, both. Yeah. Yes. So 5.5 5 is PIO and RIO both, right? So Rule 5.5 5 basically says you have two routers, right? You selected one of them as a next hop for a particular destination. Now let's look. If you have that information in your system, which prefix was advertised? So it might be just because this default router was selected because of default router preference, or because your system just received two arrays with the same preference and just picked up one of them, or because you have RIO with more specific. It might be different situations, right? It just basically, we first select next hop, and then we look in the PIO advertised by that next hop. Why we selected that particular next hop, it depends. So, uh, v 6 okay, potentially, theoretically, you can modify labels, label table, and influence the source address selection on the host. Let's say, for example, I have, again, blue and red ISP, and I want to use blue address, blue link for internet, but I still want particular host, let's say, H61 to be accessed from red address space. Mm, it is a tricky way to do this. It's possible to modify this label table, assign the same label value for red address block and the desired destination, and then try to use RFC mechanism from RFC 7078 to send it to hosts. However, this potential solution does not look feasible for many reasons. First of all, uh, there are systems which do not support DHSPv6, so we could not rely on this. Secondly, it, I'm not sure that mechanism defined in RFC is actually widely deployed. And third, as a network operator, I'm kind of confused. So now I need to go to the DHCP server and start configuring on the, all those label stuff. It doesn't look, doesn't look like it's scale. I'm pretty sure people will make mistakes and so on. And again, how I'm going to react to topology change. Let's say my blue uplink went down. What's next? My DHCP server might be somewhere in the data center. Now DHCP server needs somehow first to be informed about topology change and reconfigure all hosts. It's an introduced scalability problem, so all those hosts need to be reconfigured as uh, soon as possible. Otherwise, we'll get totally unacceptable delay. And secondly, how does that host DHCP server will know about topology change? Normally, hosts are not aware of uplinks going up and down. It's not their job. It's routers. Routers normally know about all that stuff. So yeah, it doesn't look like uh, we can do that. So draft actually has more details and discusses different scenarios and explains why DHCPv6 does not look like a solution, but I'm not going to waste any time. So again, let's just to refresh your memory, example topology, we have red and blue prefixes and red and blue ISPs. 
and we, let's say, for example, trying to access the internet through Blue Uplink. So, how it works currently, right? R router will send array with some non-zero router lifetime, means I'm your default router, and two PIOs, red and blue. It might be actually some RIOs there as well. Long term, what we can do? We might actually say, okay, we need to invent some new array option, which will tell host, okay, go to those destinations from those source, and to that destination from that source, and so on. I'm afraid it's gonna take some time. And it will require changes on a router, probably, and on a host. Which means I probably will be retired before we can get this done. <laughs> so I was thinking, is there any way we can minimize changes? And if possible, minimize changes we making on hosts. Because for me, as a person who runs a network, it's much easier to upgrade 10, 20, 100 routers and be absolutely sure that I know how they behave, I have upgraded them, I tested it, then do something about hosts, which I quite often do not even control, because it's a guest network, people bring their own devices, plugs, whatever they want into the network. Okay, so I was thinking, okay, how can we minimize the changes on the host so we don't have to do anything in operating system? Okay, so rule 5.5, five. if I have two uplinks, how can I make it work if I have just one default router? Can I make that one router pretend to be two different routers or three different routers if I have three ISPs? So let's say my router magically, because I talk to vendors, now can send not just one array, but one array per scoped forwarding table. It will send blue array for blue ISP and red array, red array for red ISP. Even better, if, I, if my host actually supports RFC 4191 for default router preference and RIO, I can say, okay, my blue ISP is my preferred ISP. So let's say at default router preference to high. And red ISP is backup ISP, so let's <coughs> set default router preference to low. And if I want my host to use red addresses, red router to access some red ISP services, I can send RIO with particular address space which should be accessed from red address block. Now, the host will pick up blue uplink for internet traffic, and as a result, as per rule 5.5, select blue source address, and for subspecial, more specific destinations in a red ISP space, it will pick up red address space, because it will be selecting uh, the red next hop. Yeah, so again, router will somehow magically, randomly, let's say, generate link local addresses and send arrays from two blue and red link local addresses. And I think in six months there is a nice RFC about how you can generate random interface ID and so on. So, when everything works, it's all simple. I actually can do similar stuff by using policy-based routing and so on. What if one uplink fails? Okay, let's say, uplink to ISPB, not all uplinks to ISPB, just the internet uplink to ISPB went down. I still can access those specific red services, but I couldn't access internet. In this case, most likely default will disappear from scope uh, forwarding table. Okay, if router doesn't have a default route, it means it, it couldn't access internet, so it shouldn't be a default router for a host. In this case, we can deprecate this host as being default router by say, setting router lifetime zero. We can still use that router to access some, as I say, more specific, some special services. So we do not deprecate the prefix, by the way. We can, but in this generic scenario, we don't. Okay, in this case, again, we're still sending packets through blue uplink with blue source and using red source only to access this specific slash 64 because we have RIO. Now let's say all uplinks to red ISP went down. Great. If my router receives a packet from red source, there is nothing in scope table to send these packets to, which means there is, it doesn't make any sense to use red address, which means, okay, great, let's deprecate it. Let's just say it PIO with preferred lifetime zero, and host would not use pref that red prefix for anything, 
except for existing established connections, because it might be intra-site connections, for example. And again, what, what I like about it is that a router actually knows about all topology changes, is it directly through interface being up or down or via a router protocol advertisement, so it will it, it can react almost immediately. So what happens if both uplinks went down? Yeah, I can deprecate both prefixes, blue and red. In this case, the question is, what if the network topology is a bit more uh, um, complicated than just one or two routers, and I still want hosts to talk to each other, I want to be able to SSH to my workstation, print some tickets, and so on. So, because in this case, basically, both prefixes will be deprecated, and there is no global addresses to use. Jan? You're you. not in trouble, you can no, George. No, it's just sparked in my head. Usually, these uh, links, usually they fail because the router uh, powers off, out, or there is a power outage, or, or it, it just freezes, or something like this. And you cannot rely that it will actually send the array with, with the lifetime zero to deprecate uh, the prefix on, 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 on the uh, Okay, first of all, we tried to cover a case which is a little bit more complex than just one router. Most, in many situations, you actually have side edge router, and you have first hop router. They're not necessarily the same routers, right? In this case, my dynamic routing pro my IGP will take care of it. If it's the same router, I have problem anyway because my next hop, my first hop router is not available. So my VRP or array with very short router lifetime will take care of it. If it's a wired network, I will most likely will send minimum router advertisement interval to three seconds. If it's wireless, I will rely on VRP to solve this problem. If the, if the router goes away, Nod will take it out of the picture. Right? If, if that router crashes after 15, whatever, 30 seconds, Nod will say it's, it's, it will take it out of the default route. Also, this still works. It's not broken. It does work. You can use a deprecated address. Yeah, okay, you couldn't, in, yeah. If you have not, no, no other addresses yet, we'll use deprecated addresses, right? Uh, but next slide, will. And yeah, the problem is, it's the same router, yeah, if it crashes, I do not care if it sent me deprecated uh, preferred lifetime zero or not because I could not talk to anyone anymore anyway, right? If, if, if that's okay, if it's one router, I do not care because I have no default router anyway. If it's not age router, in this case, it will dynamic uh, IGP uh, telling me that uplink went down. So, yes, so there are scenarios which could not be covered because it's like router just stop doing anything in forwarding packets. Yeah, I don't think we can cover this. Yeah, perhaps, uh, Chris Bowers, perhaps it would be useful to, to point out where this example is in the topology, the overall topology. This yes. is R3, and it's oh. actually way, we so, intentionally made it very far away from the side edge routers so that we can solve the actual, the most difficult problem, which is where the the routing protocols would actually have to transfer information out to that R3. The situation is a lot simpler if it's just hosts connected to the side edge routers. Um, as Jen said, if, if it's only one router, then well, you're out of luck. If there are two routers, then the other router, the other side edge router knows what to do. Yeah, so okay, we have dynamic, we have IGP, right? to take care of situation when some routers disappear, we cannot send traffic to them anymore, right? Yeah, but R3 uh, in this case will take care of talking to host based on some routing topology change. Yeah, so again, I can imagine scenarios when it's not gonna work because it's very strange bug or some strange failure mode, yeah? We're trying to solve like more standard, like reasonable scenarios. Uh, David Lampeter, so if you have rule 5.5 .5 on the end host and you're using a low lifetime <coughs> or a, then the lifetime of the prefix won't matter and it won't also won't matter if you can't deprecate a prefix because the host will use the other next top and automatically select a prefix that matches that next top. So you don't actually need to pull the prefix actively as long as you have the RA itself uh, pull, pulling the route. Back to, okay, yeah, kind of broken intra-site communication. Okay, yeah, it still might use deprecated address, but it would be nice if it would not. Mm, 
don't know. I think it's kind of, okay. I, I have a reason. All this, mo most of the use cases, right, is like, okay, I have ISP, which is expensive. I have ISP, which is cheaper. I might <laughs> actually find another ISP, which might be even cheaper. So I personally would not like to renumber my whole infrastructure every time I change ISP. So it would be actually nice to like have reasonably stable infrastructure addresses, all my printers and so on, right? So, uh, so that's why the next slide introduce ULAs. Yeah. Yeah. Just try to give a reason why. Um, I think one assumption, at least in some people's minds, is that uh, deprecated addresses are not routed anymore very well. They. they what? Well, like for for in the home networks, for instance. The, okay. So the, my understanding is, in this scenario, deprecated. Deprecated means the host knows it deprecated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the prefix itself is still connected on a router, right? Yeah. So a router will still forward yeah, packets, yeah. yeah. But locally, and if the router ah. is correctly configured, it will still route. I'm just thinking that there may, might be bugs due to deprecated addresses that are configured like, that, that are supposed to not be used. Ah. Uh, but, but my point is that if, if, if that comes back, if this discussion comes back about ULAs and so on, maybe it would make sense to actually recommend that uh, networks that deploy prefix independent, uh, uh, sorry, uh, provider uh, assigned addresses um, deploy ULA in a stable fashion. Next slide. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Great minds think alike. Okay, so I think it would be kind of nice if we create another scoped forwarding table and never advertise the default there, because we're not going to use ULAs to reach the default, and just advertise our ULA prefix, which is used to address our internal servers, printers, workstations, whatever. So you will, they will talk to each other over ULA because of uh, default address selection algorithm, and will be used PA to access internet or special services. And now if both uplinks, for example, fails, fail, both the global addresses from ISPA and B will be deprecated and only ULA will stay, but there is no default route, so it will only use RIO to reach local infrastructure. Uh, yeah, and indeed, yeah, we can actually, probably it will be a good idea to send ICMP back if router receives a packet from blue address. There is nothing in the blue forwarding table. Uh, okay, the packet obviously will be dropped. I think it's really quite nice to send ICMP back and say, okay, source address error. What host going to do, I actually don't know. I think it's a, a topic uh, still to be explored. I need to do some testing on this uh, to find out how actual implementations behave on this. Probably they do nothing. Um, or, try to, or probably they try another address and another address, and it might take a while. Uh, but anyway, it, anyway, we cannot rely on ICMP as the only solution because I've heard some approaches like let's just not to try to do anything with array, just let host try address and another address and another address. But first of all, it will introduce delays. Secondly, I don't want my routers to send ICMP to every single packet because ICMP quite often rate limited. And it's one of the reasons why pass to discovery does not work. I've seen it before. Like, yeah, I am getting... 500 packets per second, and I'm only replying, can send 200 <laughs> packets per second of ICMP back on my line card, so sorry, no luck. So yeah, ICMP is nice as a last resort <laughs> mechanism to signal errors if nothing described on the previous slide work. Yeah, to summarize, from actually most of the changes, all of the changes are actually required on the router side. We do not want to touch the host. People who are looking after routers, like vendors, uh, supposed to implement some source address dependent routing and all this what I called conditional <coughs> arrays. I want to say array with particular options based on some event on the network. Nice thing that at least we must deploy it on the edge. You don't have to deploy it everywhere, but if it's deployed on the first hop routers, it actually would help a lot. So host and first hop router side. If, if host is nice enough to support rule 5.5, which means tracking which next hop advertised which prefix, and support uh, RFC 4191, it will just work 
just a char like a charm, just out of the box, everything gonna work. If it does not, because as far as I know, Windows does support it, as operating <clears throat> system mostly not, I have a good news. I don't have slide for this because it just came out after some discussions in the lobby for the last two days. We can actually make two mo most common scenarios work. I have two uplinks, red and blue, and I am okay to use both of them, either of them. In this case here, yeah, we just advertise uh, both prefixes as long as one uplink went down, deprecate the prefix, and you use ULA yeah, if you want to use intra-site communication deprecate the prefix when uplink went down. If I want to do uh, active backup situation, I want to use blue ISP and I want to use red ISP and I don't have any wall gardens because those all wall garden stuff does require RIO and rule 55 support. I can just have blue uplink up and active. Red uplink might be up, but I don't have active default in the forwarding table or by the policy, I basically keep in the red prefix deprecated. When failover occurs, blue prefix is deprecated, red one is active. So you can actually play with conditional arrays uh, to influence source address selection on the host. It does not cover all scenarios in the draft, but it will cover quite common scenario for every single host which supports reasonably IPv6 implementation, which is a quite good use, I believe. because. My problem is we do not want to make any changes because any changes means real deployment in five years away. However, I think if it is possible to solve this problem with no changes, we probably would have solved it already. Because we are still here, we still need to sacrifice something, either some particular scenarios or we need to wait for a while to get all operating system to support what we need. Uh, and the questions, comments, Lorenzo. Uh, Lorenzo Kalidi, I think um, there are a lot of things that we know how to do, and I think we should write them down and publish something. <coughs> because uh, I think what you have is uh, really sneaky and really cool, uh, but it does rely on 5.5 and RIO, which I think is kind of the mi minority of hosts. On some scenarios, as I say, for. Yeah. Uh, for wall gardens mostly, right. for just for two uplinks, we actually can do it right now, right away, with no changes on the host as long as router vendors will give me conditional arrays. We don't want to give the router vendors the impression that nothing can happen in the next five years. All right? We want to tell them that these things can happen today. And I want hosts, it to happen today. And that the hosts have been ready for several years. And so I, I would see value in having perhaps even its own documents say, here are multi-homing scenarios that work today in IPv6, multi-prefix multi-homing and the address deprecation. And we can write it down. And that's, I think, a substantial step forward because you need fe uh, features from your router vendors. And if you have an RFC to beat them on the head with saying, this is what works, then you, can, you, know, you stand a better chance of those features. So do I hear a volunteer to write that? Uh, oh, yeah, have discussed actually, it yes, for once. <laughs> I volunteer to co-author. <laughs> so um, uh, second point is, what you have is really sneaky and really cool. I would love if we could do it, but I don't know how it falls over when hosts don't support RIO and or they don't support rule 5.5. Maybe we can look at it and say, well, if they don't support this, then they're screwed anyway in this other scenario and it doesn't matter. Uh, or maybe we can look at it and say, there's a migration path to this. If there's no migration path, then I think we have a problem in the sense that, you know, it's, it's very hard to get to, your, uh, to, to, where, to where you want to be. And maybe we need a different mechanism and you might have to involve Sixman to make it work. So that's another reason why we should document immediately what we can do today and try to start getting the ball rolling. Because I think the scenarios that you say work today are a lot of scenarios and are quite useful. Uh, so my understanding is, if we're going to write this document describing what works today if router vendor gives me a conditional array, it's uh, this uh, testing result about what would work on a host which does not support 5.5, it does not support uh, 4191 should be part of the document. Because again, those two basic scenarios, don't, uh, they don't even rely on 4191. I'm basically using, if I use active backup, I don't even need default router preference. I just <laughs> keep one prefix deprecated until I need it, right? 
So it's actually, it should work for the hosts which do not support neither 5.5 or 4.191. But, but yeah, we need to do document. some testing. That we should just write it today and it'll publish it tomorrow, that, that one. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Does anybody have the, the other blue sheet? Look around if you see it, raise it in the air. Okay, that's interesting. So <laughs> keep an eye out for the other blue sheet. Okay, Brian Carpenter. Uh, I've actually got three points because I've been standing at the microphone for a while uh, waiting. Um, first thing is there is a document that's just come out of Six Man, which I help, think helps with the 5.5 issue. Uh, Fred. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it, it, of course. All these things take time to get into hosts, but at least we now have a document um, that says what hosts should be doing. So uh, this Fred, is the Molly Home. This is the Molly Home host document. Yeah, exactly. Fred is a co author. I'm a co author. Is there another co author? I think it's just the two of us. No, um, just us chickens. Yeah. Um, second thing is there is also an RFC uh, number 3582, which is a few years old, which actually is supposed to indicate the goals that the ITF concluded we had to meet for site multi homing. So this is just repeating a comment I sent by email that I really think your document needs to have a little section that goes through those goals with a check mark for the ones it meets and a cross for the ones it doesn't meet. Um, third thing is, can you go back to slide 20? Okay, okay. Uh, if you like, sure. Um, I actually don't think that we should uh, that we should hold ourselves to addressing an informational document that is at least eight years old and sort of getting wound up in th this this topic has so much history that we tend to just get wound up in references to RFCs and part of the goal of this was to just start with with something of a clean slate at least in my mind and say what can we do today and so I I actually don't think that that would be useful for someone reading this document I disagree violently. I think the point of those goals that they were a consensus, and I don't think the problem has changed since those in those years. Okay, never mind. We can discuss that at our leisure. Um, so, uh, consider an application in H31, which has opened a TCP connection with H101. Right. At that point, the link from S-E-R-A to I-S-P-A goes down. What happens to that TCP connection? The same as it happens today with both current and legacy IP protocols, it will die. Unless okay. you're using some other mechanism which is a little bit higher than IP, right? Okay. Now, that is important in relation to my previous comment because that is precisely the one goal in RFC 3582 that nobody has ever yet met successfully, except with SHIM-6, which is undeployable, by the way. So, uh, with, I, you know, I, I actually, I actually, I actually want, I actually want to see source address routing work in enterprise and home networks, right? I really want this to work, but I think we should be very clear that we have not solved that problem of, um, of service session continuity for TCP sessions when one of the addresses goes away, right? And if and you have to be very clear that that is not a goal, which is why I want you to look at those goals. If, if that's not a goal, it's fine, but we need to know it's not a goal, otherwise people will constantly misinterpret what you're trying to do. I believe that becomes a transport layer problem. It's uh, TCP that is locked onto an ad address and won't give it up. So your solution becomes M MPTCP or ILNP or you know one of those things that loosens TCP up. Uh, okay. Actually, after um, after my presentation on Tuesday in the routing working group, it was a follow up on the mailing list. Yeah, with uh, examples yeah of using MPTCP to my existing work on higher layers, and then it works perfectly fine. Yeah, but. We c I don't think we can solve it on IP layer unless we start using all this shim stuff, which probably not also deployable. I don't know. 
So again, yeah, we, we're not try, trying to solve this problem. If, we'd, if you'd like us to make it clear in the document, we probably can state it that it's not supposed to solve problems which haven't been solved before for IPv4, for example. We are not keeping session, st session state. Pierre Pister, um, I have five different comments. <laughs> I will try to go fast. The first one is a thank you uh, coming from the home networking group. I think this is a useful document for us as well. Um, we need to address this problem of source address selection in these environments, in the multi environments. Um, second comment with regard to the six-man document, uh, Brian. The, um, so I think the six-man document addresses the, ne uh, the, the next hop selection problem. Not exactly, yeah, so you agree. The, so the source address selection problem is this document, so they are not colliding. Um, then there is a little bit of confusion, I think, in the community and maybe in the draft as well, between uh, what SADR is and what um, policy-based routing is. So I think, just let me explain, I think the, the algorithm that SADR uses is a bit different. They are, they are equivalent, right, in terms of you can configure to do the same thing, but in your document you use the word SADR and you um, specify it as using multiple routing tables, which I think is policy-based routing. Uh, I, to be honest, I just briefly look at source address destination routing draft, and I think it, yeah, what is the, it recommends is different from what we are doing here because I think that draft does look at the destination first and then in source when we actually look at the source first and then in the destination. For uh, the reason is here, yeah, so you can totally isolate those routing uh, scope tables and so on. But I think the, the uh, so address destination routing actually mentions this algorithm as one of the options. So yeah, we're doing slightly different yeah, things. They, they yeah. are strictly equivalent because you can implement, uh, you can configure uh, both algorithm with both implementations. But what the difference is the, algori is the algorithm and the solution which uses different routing tables with first matching the source address and then looking at the destination, I think is policy-based routing. And source address dependent routing, it's when you do uh, longest destination first and longest source then, I think. Yeah, I think we explicitly say in the draft that what we are doing is different from source <coughs> address destination routing. That's why D here is actually st stands for dependent, uh, probably. So yeah, we can probably discuss it offline. Yeah, I understand there is some confusion in yeah, terminology. The, 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 yeah, point yeah. Is, the point is just that when we talk about that, I talk about that to people and many people are confused. So I just would like us to look at the draft and try to clarify this. Yeah, because people are really confused about that. Maybe myself, maybe I just am confused. Um, so uh, there was one point about recommending ULAs in these kind of networks. Uh, I think it should be in the draft, like uh, recommend uppercase. I mean, no, uh, should, I mean, uppercase. Uh, finally, last point with regard to um, the, when you have multiple prefixes, advertised by the same router uh, for multiple different uplinks. And you know the fact that when there is an uplink that is down, so your, your proposal, which is, I think, a working workaround with sort of virtual routers, uh, virtual arrays. So it works, it's a workaround. Doesn't that show oh. that there is something wrong? Or, I mean, something that might be modified in the future? So uh, I understand that Lorenzo looks at the legacy host is 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 he's right. This looks like at what we could do in like near future, but maybe there is something to be done longer term to try to fix neighbor discovery protocol uh, for for um, source address dependent routing. Let because making one router sends no, multiple yes. arrays with multiple different source addresses look like a hack. It's it's a kind of hack, yeah. And sorry, it was a bit long. Yeah, so, okay. It's quite possible that we might have, we might develop something better. I'm all ears. I would happy to hear about better solution, right, long term. But my problem is I have this problem. I actually need to solve it yesterday, two years ago, right? That's why I'm trying to do something with, like, minimal changes on the host. Yeah, I know there is a, there was a draft about a spe a, a special uh, array option, right, to do something like that. Yeah, we might keep working on better solution, better long-term solution. Yeah, indeed. I'm not saying we should do it and then go and get retired and relax. I know. fully agree with you. So, Dave Taylor. Uh, so thank you for doing this. I really like this proposal, so great work. Um, 
the so I I think the notion of being able to describe things as if it was multiple virtual routing tables and how you get BCP 38 for free, I think that's all a nice clean way to explain stuff. So I really enjoyed that part. Um, the only suggestion that I have, which is aligned with I think what you're trying to do, is um, which is you know. What's the best you can do without touching the host or the applications or anything, right? I can touch the router, but I can't touch that. What's the best I can do? And this is a really great way to phrase that. Um, what 4191 does is it says, well, there's three types of hosts, right, which it calls A, B, and C, which are ones that don't do 4191, ones that do the router preferences but not the, not the RIO, and then ones that do the RIO. And then you got this other access, which is things that do uh, rule 5.5 or not, right? And it would be useful to say for each of these different variations of hosts that actually exist, and I don't know if all, all of these combinations actually exist, right? Out of the ones that actually exist that are out there, um, what's the behavior that you get once a router starts doing this, right? Assume that there's a, a heterogeneous set of hosts, one of each of those on the same link. Here's what the router does. What's the behavior each one of those gets, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the I, approach that 4191 took. And as long as it's described that way, ship it. Yeah, uh, it's uh, version zero zero. I'm sorry, we just submitted like a week before ATF, yeah. so it no, no. needs to be polished. My only concern yeah. is I already, as I said, only a few people managed to read it, like all 44 right, pages, right? right? Yeah. I'm really concerned about making it even longer. I don't know what the people limits, how many pages they are willing to read. I, 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 think this was, uh, I think Lorenzo made the same point, which is it's important to understand um, what the impact is going to be. Right? If I'm going to put this in my router or whatever, how are the different hosts that are out there going to react to it? And it helps me feel safe if I if the analysis is in there that says, oh, here's how a non-4191 uh, speaker would behave, would behave, right? Certain things will work, certain things won't work, but hey, that's what you get because it's a very uh, limited host, right? Something on the other end of the spectrum that implements all these, you get all these nice behaviors and so on. And just having that makes the reader feel very good about, okay, I feel safe in putting this thing in here. So I think it actually adds to the impact of the document by doing that. And that's why that information was put into 4191 for the same reason. Yeah, so, I, I agree. We probably need to explain in more details yeah, what's happened here in different scenarios if host does not support our requirements. Yeah, we might need to look into it yeah, at some point. Um, Benedict Stockerbans, Tablet IT. I've been playing around with sort of stuff um, or similar stuff um, quite a few years ago, and um, there is one problem. Multi homing basically means we're dealing with sites, however, we want to define these, that are not big enough to have their own either PI addresses or their own LAR, basically. Right? So um, we actually have uh, people using this who quite likely are home users or, or small businesses or whatever who actually have to set this up. And as exciting as it was to do something like this uh, like 10 years ago, it was a hell of a lot of work for somebody who actually knew what he was doing. Um, actually doing it in a way that people with, with limited knowledge in networking, because they also have to know about uh, toner cartridges and whatever, uh, might actually be a bit of a problem. If we want this to be successful, and I think it's a good idea, uh, we need to address that this has to be pretty much plug and play or as close to plug and play as possible. Otherwise, it'll be just ignored. Yeah, uh, indeed, yeah. I actually keep it in mind, yes. That actually, people are smart enough to do all this policy-based routing in V4 and send like packets based on this or like do this uh, not uh, at the edge. So I'm pretty sure uh, when router vendors could make configuration intuitive enough here yeah, for this to work. I'm pretty sure we need to basically to make clear how to mark, how to color those prefixes, right? And everything else should be basically done out of the box probably. Yeah. So yeah. what I get, it's kind of how you implement this particular feature on particular router, right? So I'm not sure it's exactly in scope, but I totally agree here. Yeah. It would be really nice to minimize the configuration required to make this work, yeah. Yes, exactly, that's the point. If, uh, if, if there is any th configuration that's needed, no matter how it's implemented, then we already created a problem rather than solved one. So we'll make it plug and pray. Uh, I, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but um, we only have 22 minutes left. <laughs> so we may need to keep our comments a little shorter now. Thanks. Okay, I'll try for short, uh, David Lampeter. So to respond to your comment, we have a working group for that. It's called HomeNet. Um, they are doing exactly that, so just go deploy home net order. Um, then um, I want to, uh, like, plus one PR's comment, so I think you could actually improve the draft by removing some of the description of how the routing system should behave, which would actually remove some of the 
ambiguities and uh, mismatches between the descriptions as well. Um, and third and last, um, I think it's important to note here that there's two different things that we can solve here, one of which is what we can do without hosts implementing the rule 5.5 by controlling uh, the prefixes. And then there's another set of problem which we can solve if we have rule 5.5, and that is very important uh, to point out and really emphasize in, in the discussion about this. Yeah, yeah, I, as I say that probably basically what Lorenzo is talking about, having draft, which may, or part of the document saying this is works right now, because to be honest, when I, we came up with this idea, I did, we didn't have time to do real testing, to find out how many systems actually have rule 5.5 and how many don't. So it was a pure theoretical construction. Okay, if host implement what is already in the standard track of RFC, right, it would work. Okay, if they don't, yeah, we need to explicitly uh, uh, define what's going to happen. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Tim Chang, yeah, I really like this as well. Please keep going with it. Uh, it seems like a long, a long road since Christian Hiratimo and others started talking about this like 12 plus years ago. Um, just on 7078. Um, the idea of that, the HTTP based option, right. was for a fairly static environment like an enterprise where you just want to configure something different to the default that would come in the operating system. It's not, it, we had said at the time it wasn't designed for a dynamic environment, wasn't said it wasn't for a dynamic environment. And I think the other thing um, for the 6724 update, when we put in the hook for rule 5.5, it wasn't wholly clear then exactly how that would work, but to come forward with ideas for how you can make that work is, is really good as well. So yeah, just keep going. You might also want to think about forming a working group for this. Might we could call it something like six multi, something like that. It might be, might might get legs. Yeah. So actually, about DHCP in this case, yeah, I don't know if you should it should be in the draft or not. But it basically means that if you're just using DHCP v6 and you disabled Slack, you will have problem with multi homing sooner or later. Yeah, unless you introduce some even more hacky stuff to in integrate your DHCP server into routing topology, make it basically a router, right? Yeah. I'm not even sure you can express this using DHCPv6. Maybe with two uplinks you can, but I think with, with 7078, I think if you have three, it doesn't work anymore because you don't know, you can't assign different labels to the default routes. I, I'm not sure it actually works. Um, no, we haven't tried it. We'll just like, okay, how can we control the labels? Yeah, we can distribute labels. Let's see. And draft discusses why it's not feasible. Yeah, I just put it on the slides because otherwise people will probably come to Mike and ask me, what about the, using the HTTP v6? Yeah, so I'm explaining why not. Uh, Lorenzo Kuri again. I am concerned that your draft is 45 pages long. Even I did try to read it and I got halfway through. I, 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 so I think it might benefit from uh, scoping it down a little bit. Uh, however you want to split it up, it seems to me like a natural boundary is the rooting one, working group wants to control how SATA works in the enterprise. Everything that touches their boxes, they want to control they, because they understand routing. What I observe from going to the routing working group is that they have no idea how the routers signal this stuff to the hosts. They might know about DHP before, but that's where their knowledge stops. Like this is given the, given the questions that were in, um, in the working group. Now that, that presents us with a problem. The people who know about this are maybe in HomeNet and maybe here and nowhere else. So I don't know what we want to do with that, but I think possibly what we could do is say, well, okay, let's do the routing part with SATER and enterprise SATER and MPLS based and tunnel based and everything in the routing working group. Have the routing working group figure out how to make an enterprise cloud of routers do SATER efficiently and do the host communication somewhere else, like here or in HomeNet. Lorenzo, do you, don't you think that in this case, they will never know how hosts work? It Isn't it the matter, chance right? to it, like introduce this problem to route and area? I don't know how I, I don't know how OSPF works in detail. I know a little bit about how BGP works. I don't need to know. You know, people have limited time. I think if we split the load across two working groups, it might be better. Um, one other thing I wanted to say is HomeNet, right? Have we verified that HomeNet behaves like this? Did you try it? Or maybe Pierre knows already because he wrote it. No, I haven't. Um, does, does HomeNet do the deprecation? It doesn't do her fancy like virtual router thing, but does it do deprecation? So that's, that's the re reason I said that deprecated addresses may be problematic. I think the, in, in HomeNet, in HMCP, the, um, the deprecated addresses are not uh, fluted through HMCP anymore but they are still there. So the routing protocol actually still routes them. So that, that, I mean, that's why I'm concerned about possible bugs with using deprecated addresses for routing. And that's why I say that 
yeah, ULA addresses might be useful. Is that in the spec or is it how it's, it, No, it's on the spec, it's in the spec. Um, and it uses, uh, it uses RIOs, I mean, on that, uh, it's, it may be a should or a may, but there is some RIO in there saying, um, giving the host the information that it needs to, to have between default routes and uh, local routes, saying, okay, this, this is the prefix, this is the 56 that you can reach um, in the home network, and my default route, because I know the applicant is down, is actually set with lifetime zero. But you can still use the RIO. Yeah, my understanding is if your default router lifetime is zero, you still expect it to use RIO reachable through the router because it just means it's a default router. At least it's what RFC says. So yeah, on that point, I don't remember uh, between the implementation and the RFC. But 4191 explicitly says, so, or probably not that RFC, basically, if your default router lifetime is zero, it just means it's not a default router, all other options should be still processed and used, as far as I can remember when I checked last time. I'm not sure what the real world behavior is, actually. Philip Diesel, TU Berlin. Um, I really like your idea, and I really like the way um, how you extensively described it. Um, the funny thing is, I came across a similar problem uh, a few years ago um, when working on an access selection thingy, which is more or less a source of selection thingy. I put a student <laughs> on the project and saying, oh, let's look how you can auto-configure this. And exactly the problem turned out that it's more or less in the RFCs, but it's more or less in no implementation, at least on Linux. And uh, the good thing is, at least, Configuring multiple routing tables for a client should go in the upstream of DHCP CD sometime in the future. Okay. Uh, Chris Bowers, I just wanted to address a, a suggestion that Lorenzo had made about splitting the document up. And at the same time, um, he, he pointed out that the the knowledge in the routing area and the routing area working group about host router interactions is, is pretty limited. And so I think it's actually quite useful to not split it up because there's a lot of people in the routing area who say, well, why do we need to propagate the source dependent routing information all the way out to the, to the first hop router? And it, it really helps to, to drag them through this to say, well, this is why, because the host needs to select the source address and uh, and the the routing protocol is is the most obvious way to do that. So I, although I understand it's a it's a large document, it's it's I think it's better to 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 leave it like that. You know, home off the the other parts about like best current practices about what can currently be done as a separate document, but leave it together and and force uh, people to pay attention to it and not divide it. And let me add to that that. Um if the routing working group doesn't understand the host, uh, it might be good for people that do understand the host to contribute there. Uh, David Lampeter again. So I think a kind of a middle ground here is to document the requirements to the routing system that need to be fulfilled for this to work. Um, while currently there's an entire section on how to generate scoped routing tables, which in my opinion doesn't belong in this draft. So I think the draft does need to document we need these functionalities from the routing system, like propagating the SATA routes until the last top uh, towards the user. Um, but the point where it drifts into the behavior of the routing system itself, describing how it should do that is probably the, the cutoff point for me. There is one tricky part there. I just yesterday realized you might actually have a current version on draft, we might have a kind of inconsistency because how we currently define in the draft, how we populate scope tables, means you always copy non-existent destinations from unscope to scope, which means I will always have default there and I'm actually relying here on not having default. So we might need, so I think it will be useful to provide more details on how those scope forwarding tables should be built to ensure that we can meet the conditions for sending conditional arrays. I don't know, I just invented the term, right? Like uh, arrays happening by, uh, upon some routing events, right? So it would be nice that we know how routing system behave here. So, um, so, so Jen, I think also, I mean, you and I had a 
conversation on scope crowding tables a couple of days ago. This can also be implemented using a Patricia algorithm or something like that, which wouldn't require that. Uh, so, so the scope crowding tables are a solution. They're not the only possible solution. Yeah, so hence I, I would try to keep away from the how and stick to the what and why. I mean, we're, the draft isn't discussing how the host should implement Rule 5.5 either. So that's to go to some neighbor discovery draft uh, if it needs be. And I guess it's the same for the routing system. We need to have the what and why maybe um, written down very exactly. Um, but the how is kind of a different topic, I think. So Barbara? Barbara Stark. Um, so from a home nut perspective, one thing that's really bothering me is the hubris of routers thinking that they know best what the application needs. I would really rather not have the routers be trying to tell the end devices what's best for them. What I would prefer is for routers to provide information kind of along the lines of, I think there have been discussions in Babel around the net JSON, where routers can simply provide some XML information, for example, along the lines of, and this may not be good for enterprises, but I'm thinking home net, um, information along the lines of, you know, what are, is my uplink speed? What is my latency that I'm experiencing? How, you know, um, and let the application decide, you know, I'm okay, a I'm gonna camp the mic line after Jeff. I'm a video stream, I want high bandwidth, I'm a VoIP stream, I want low latency, and I don't think it's up to the router be, to be necessarily telling the... Uh, I think, especially in enterprise space, which is a main target for this draft, it might be a problem because an en as an enterprise network engineer, I am paying for bandwidth, right, in many places. And I do want to tell my host which, uh, cha which uplink to use, even if some... A user came to the office with some device which go in to use peer-to-peer -peer application and trying to send a lot of traffic over very expensive channel, over expensive uplink, right? So it's kind of conflict of interest here, right? And again, we we do target we do thinking about enterprises first of all because HomeNet was trying to kind of solve this problem for uncontrolled home environment. Big companies, big networks have BGP. This is area which hasn't been addressed so far. Yeah, and they and those networks have a kind of special requirements in terms of who has the upper hand on how to send the traffic. Jeff Houston, Shim Six, veteran. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Brian's right. Shim Six died, and part of the reason why it died was actually a presentation of Shim Six into Nanog, and the network operators assembled there basically said. No goddamn host is going to tell us where and how traffic flows. We will never, ever, ever see <coughs> that degree of policy, policy ability in traffic to dumb, insignificant customers. We run the network, it's our policies, get stuffed. And it was that tension that's sitting there going, we are not going to give any ability to the host to determine when and how ingress and egress works in multi-addressing that killed it dead. There was kind of no answer because Shim6 was trying to effectively empower the host to select from the multiple addresses it had, addresses that actually allowed it to select ingress and egress. And until you can get over that basic tension, you're condemned to relive that life. But that's okay. Whoever said all those old documents are bullshit, they're all bullshit. You're gonna find this again though, again and again. There's a real tension here between the host and the network and this isn't helping it. Well, you know, I lived the life, Lorenzo, and that was part of this reason why it just simply never got anywhere. The network operators were going, not at all. But I think in this case, we actually allow network operator to control. Because we're not going to send blue packets to red uplink anyway, so it's not going to use it. We're just trying to minimize the disruption on the host it's causing. Um, what do you have a response? What are you asking me? Is the, I just said, is, is the mic still? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Okay, Michael Abrahamson. So I was also part of this discussion, and I was not, there were, there were some operators who were saying what Jeff relayed, there were others that didn't agree. Um, and I would say we have MPTSP today and so on, and nobody's got, I, if you ask the question again, you might get a different answer too. So I, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't say I subscribe to what Jeff just said. Okay, we're very close to time. Um, so, Jordy, you had a presentation you wanted to do. Can you do it in seven minutes? Okay. Huh? Okay, sure. Again? While he's plugging that in, I'm curious, how many people here are using either the IETF NAT64 or the IETF V6 only SSID? Raise your hand. Cool. I've been having some conversations with the NOC. I'm curious about what kinds of things, and they're curious, but uh, whether everything's working, if anybody's seen any kind of uh, issues. So maybe not flood them with uh, <coughs> issues right now, but love to see some notes. Thanks. OK. Um, I started a, a very small survey. It was actually just four questions in the RIPE IPv6 uh, uh, mailing list. And then I realized that I was getting too many answers, so I decided to make a serious uh, survey. Um, the basic idea of the survey is to understand how uh, ISPs around the world are actually deploying IPv6. What are uh, the different features that they are deploying to residential customers, okay? So those are the, the different uh, parts of the survey. I am going to, to go through each of one. Um, I have done this presentation on Sunday on the IPG meeting. I added only this slide. So if you look at the previous version, this slide is new one. This was a consequence of something on, on the IPG meeting that asked me how many people actually was using IPv6 to respond the survey. So I look at that this, and it was almost 40% of the people using IPv6. So it's not bad. This is, of course, considering that some people may be using IPv6, but happy eyeballs or whatever could fall back to IPv4, okay? So it, this is what actual responses I got by means of IPv6 itself. I need to thank to the, all the registries because all of them cooperated to, to, to disseminate the, the survey. I got actually 900 responses, which is not bad, in about two months. Um, I filtered out duplicate responses, so actually about 8-9% of the responses were coming from the same ISPs, and of course, to do a good statistic, I want to keep only one response for every ISP, so even I needed to contact with some ISPs when the data was different from different responders, okay? Actually, it was not very difficult because most of the time it was coincident. So this is the responses I got. The, the only question here is I got very, very few, actually only 16 responses from, from Africa. So I am going to contact again with Afrinic to try to improve this, this, the response from, from that region. Um, another interesting thing is that I didn't got responses from Japan, Korea, India, and China. So during the ITF, I have been contacting people from these regions and actually this morning already set up a Japanese version of the survey, so they can now respond in Japanese. Um, this is difficult to read. Basically, it's the number of responses per country. There are some interesting countries like Brazil in just 10 days because we did a Portuguese version. We got 40 responses, so it was quite good. I hope we can get the same from, from all these countries in Asia Pacific I mentioned. Um, one of the questions said was about the technology. More or less, we can see that most of the people deploying IPv6 is using uh, FTTH, cable, and DSL. This is more or less about the same amount or, uh, in every technology. I am going quick uh, because we are running out of time. Um, another question was, it is already a commercial service? Well, some people didn't respond it actually was almost half of the people, but from the people who responded, uh, almost 300 people said it was already a commercial service, it was not just a trial or something like that, so it's not that bad. Um, next question set was, what kind of link uh, are you providing for the one? So are you, for, for example, providing a slash 64 or a slash uh, 127 or whatever? So that was the responses I got. Uh, is that prefix stable? Stable in the sense of, are you always giving to the one link the same addressing? 
um, is it a ULA or it's a link local or is a global unicast address? Um, is this prefix from the same uh, pool as you are providing to the customer uh, for their lands or it's a different one? If And if it's from the same, it's maybe the same uh, space that the customer got inside. For example, if the customer is getting a slash 56, is it the first slash 64 from the slash 56? And well, actually some people is doing that way. Um, oops, I think I skipped it too, yeah. Same questions about the LAN. Are you providing a slash 48, a slash 56, something different? I got some people providing a slash uh, 64, which is not quite good. Fortunately, not too many people, but they got also very strange responses like shared slash 64 among different customers, which I don't understand how they are doing, but it seems some people very, very few, fortunately, are doing that. Um, same about if the, the prefix for the customer LAN is stable. Uh, it means if they power cycle the router or uh, if they change the network, whatever, but are in the same link, they don't move from another, from one home to another home, they get the same prefix. And if they don't got it, if the customer can opt to have it stable, okay? So that was the, the question, and if that means any extra cost. Now, are you still providing IPv4? Of course, most of the people responded yes, but very, very few responded not. So some people, it seems they are already deploying IPv6 only. Um, I was asking also some uh, about the same questions, like if the IPv4 address is stable or not, if it means extra cost, and so on. What transition mechanism are you using? Well, most of the people is using dual stack, which means public IPv4 for the one link and then uh, global unicast addresses. Okay, you can see a few other answers. There is only one responder, I think, using map uh, T, I think it was. Nobody, nobody using map E. Some people using 464XLAT and some others. If um, you provide some DNS services for the IPv6 prefix. Those are the three questions I made. There is a reverse DNS, there is NS delegation, or there is a DNAME if you don't have a stable uh, IPv6 prefix. And I think that's it. Uh, just some general uh, conclusions like, well, in general, I think people is deploying quite correctly IPv6. There are all, all obviously some exceptions, and I can notice that Bigger ISPs and especially in, in the, let's say, more advanced countries are doing it better than, for example, the responses I got from Africa or from some countries in Latin America. Okay, so I think that that's interesting because that means probably we need to 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 to, go, to, to give some hints to people that this is starting now to correct some of the the ways they are doing the deployment. Um, that's it, thank you. I will keep doing the, the survey and I plan to update it every couple of months or three months, maybe three, four times per year and keep posting it some, somewhere. Um, did you also, to, uh, Tobias Meyer, Cisco, um, did you also do a survey on the method what the service providers are using for assigning? Like, are they Yes, using? one of the questions, but I didn't have time and I don't know exactly how to put that in the slides. I ask it, what provisioning mechanism you are using? Exactly, I yeah. got several answers. Not everybody is using, uh, responding to that. Very few people, but I plan to have one additional slide with an explanation about that. Thank you. By the way, most of the people, of course, was using the HCPv6 prefix delegation and so on, as you can guess. Okay. Uh, the survey is online. You, you have here the link. The slide set not because I did just for Sunday presentation, but I plan to have uh, somehow maybe in the same link or something uh, the actual data. Okay. Of course, the data is anonymous. I don't want to publish the names of the ASPs because I know otherwise they will not respond and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jordi. And these slides will obviously be at the meeting materials site if you want to look at them. So hang on just a second. Get the copy.
Still looking for the other blue sheet. Has anybody here not, not put their name on a blue sheet? And can anybody, as they're walking around, look for the other one and bring it up here? Thanks. And with that, we're working on posting the uh, slides, and we are adjourned. No. Uh, 1400.